Hello, hello everybody. Good evening. Um, thank you very much for joining us. I can see we have we have people joining as I speak, which is great. Um, this evening we have got James Donkin from Hartlepool Six One College delivering a session for us on effective teaching. Why? Um, before we go into that though, what I'll do is just go over a few housekeeping things whilst we're here tonight. Hello, hello everybody. Good Give evening. You Oh, um, thank you very much for joining us. I can see we have we've got an echo there, James. <laughs> Great. Um, this evening we have got James Donkin from Hartlepool Six One College delivering a session for us. Ah, there we go. Sorry, sorry about that. It's all right. Don't worry about it. Oops. Nobody needs to listen to me twice. Um, <laughs> we are here. Um, like I say, we are on Teams Live this evening, so we are live, um, as you can probably tell. Yeah. And we have. Um, a few things just to let you know in case you haven't attended a Teams live session before. So hopefully you can hear and see us fine. Hopefully you can only hear me once. My voice is not a nice voice. You don't need to be hearing me twice. Um, but if you do have any questions for us and you're wondering how you can get those over to us, in one of the corners of your device, you should see there's um, a Q&A function which will give you the option to type any questions that you might have for James throughout his presentation and send them over to us. And what we'll do is at the end of the presentation, I'll go through those questions with James. Um, other than that, we have had a couple of technical issues with Teams this week. We aren't anticipating any more, fingers crossed. But um, if anything does happen, I will um, contact you via email and we are recording the session as well, so it'll be available for you. Um, afterwards on our Teachers and Careers Advisor website. But that is me pretty much done. What I'll do is I'll hand over to James. As I said, we do have James Duncan here this evening, who is from Hartlepool Sixth Form College, and he's going to be delivering a session on effective teaching, so the use of technology to engage and enhance learners. So I will hand over to you, James, if you're ready. Yep, I'm ready. Thanks, Jade. Uh, hi everyone, it's a real honour to be asked to present at the conference this year. Uh, shame we're not actually in the same room, but um, the wonders of technology means we can still sort of get something um, out there. So I teach chemistry, as you're going to find out, um, but and I don't think there are any other sort of science teachers, chemistry teachers in the room, but that doesn't matter. Hopefully you'll all get something from the session. Okay, so the, the, the sort of way I'm going to do this, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself, very brief, um, my career to date, my digital journey, which is kind of going to be the main focus, um, how I've used technology in my teaching. I'll then go into flipped learning, um, sort of how I've kind of got to use that, um, what I've learned along the way, because it has been a, a sort of learning process for me. Um, how I feel it benefits my students and how I know it benefits others as well. I'll go into that. Um, and then I'll do a little bit about Google Classroom because I use Google Classroom to kind of um, push the, um, the content out there to the students. So maybe some of you use Google Classroom. If you don't, obviously I'm going to be talking about that and hopefully you'll, you'll get something from that. Um, and then I'll finish with um, what's next for me kind of thing in this digital journey because it what i've realized is it, it doesn't stop it just keeps getting more and more advanced as we go on um and then as jade said this question as a q a session at the end okay so very quickly about me i started teaching in 1993 um and i taught in three local secondary schools uh taught key stage three to five science mainly chemistry but um i did do the other sciences as well so they were the sort of years that i um i, I worked in those those three schools um i was going for promotions which i think was what a lot of people do um but what i quickly realized was it was starting to take me away from what i actually enjoyed which was being in the classroom and the lab in my case and actually teaching the students so um, the, the sort of final promotion or the final straw for me, if you like, was I was uh, head of science at a, at a secondary school and I was responsible for 13 teachers and three technicians and I just wasn't really enjoying um, what I was doing anymore. So um, the job came up with Tartlepool Sixth Form College, um, which is where I am now in 2008, head of chemistry and basically it allowed me to focus on teaching chemistry and 
um, I, I was very, very happy and have been ever since. Um, one thing I've got written in my notes here, um, I, I asked Jade what the makeup of the um, of the of the teachers were attending because um, I wasn't sure at first if there was going to be mainly college teachers or um, secondary school teachers. I know for a fact that if I was still teaching in a secondary school, I would not be able to do the amount of stuff that I've been able to do here. Uh, my wife teaches in a secondary school and she teaches year seven all the way through to year 13. Um, so she teaches on all those different courses, um, all those different year groups, whereas I am very, very lucky here because I just teach A-level chemistry to year 12 and year 13. So I essentially teach one course. So that's why I've been able to do um, what, I've do, what, what I've done. Okay, so my digital journey started, basically it all kind of started when I came here, um, pretty much. Um, 2010, I started a Facebook page for the chemistry department, for the chemistry students. 2011, I sort of, I sort of dived into Twitter. Um, and then in 2013, I started an Instagram page because the students would laugh at me and go, James, nobody uses Facebook anymore. And, you know, so Instagram's kind of where it's at. So I had kind of had to, to get the grips with that. And the kind of stuff I would push out there would be, uh, you can see just daft little pictures I used to make, things like that, of just ways to remember sort of formulae that we use in chemistry. Um, you can probably see my musical influences in that picture there, but just ways to remember things that we have to do in chemistry. And also it was a bit of a marketing tool as well. So this is um, quite an old photo now, this one, but we used to take the year 13 students before COVID uh, to Sunderland Uni for the day. And um, we would um, basically have a day at the uni and all that sort of information would go out and um, and it would hope, you know, promote the department, promote the college. Um, for future for future students. Um, then sort of I kind of I w alongside all of that, I was using um, this guy from Canada. I think he's from called Chem Guy um, and I, I really sort of liked the way he did stuff. So I'll just quit a very short clip of, of what the kind of stuff That's he was doing. The first carbon here. This was going to be the second one here. The triple bond starts at the lowest number here between the one and the two here. That's the one. So it's a butte one ion. This is a butte one ion. This is a butte two ion. These are isomers of each other, right? Yeah, they're isomers. Okay. And so what I would do with those videos um, were I would sort of, I would push them to my students and I would say, um, we're going to be starting this topic in um, next lesson. I'd like you to watch Chem Guy's video on alkynes. I'll use that because that's that's the thing uh, that's on the screen at the moment. I really, really liked the sort of the way he put stuff across. Um, really simple technique, just him, a whiteboard and a pen. Um, and the students used to say to me that they, they found it really useful. The only problem with um, with Chem guy's stuff was because he was teaching in Canada, their curriculum was different to mine. Um, so I kind of thought, why don't I give this a go as well? So I kind of decided to to get into making videos um, for my students. OK, so that's going to be sorry. the first carbon here. This was going to be the second one here. Yeah. So. March 2013, I started to um, make my first videos um, the, the bit of a this is more of a sort of bloopers video, but the, there's a reason why I'm going to show you this one. Right, so the next part of the quiet is the electrophilic attack by the. Uh, uh, what should that say? That should say CL plus. Sorry about that. Silly me, right. Oh. oh, right, shall I quit this or what? Let's keep going, shall we? The comedy effect. Right, so the reason I'm showing you that one is because when I when I first, I mean, Chem Guy made it look so easy. Um, and as soon as I was kind of trying to give it a go, it was an absolute nightmare. Um, because as you can see on that video, I made loads and loads of, loads of mistakes. The students absolutely loved it though, because I think that they just they just quite liked watching me make a, a sort of fool of myself. Um, and the reason I've got here, 
it, it used to take forever to make the videos. I think I made a total of three videos in this style and I just thought that just this is just no way to do this. Um, so yeah, the other thing about this is this this technique. It was called screen R. So basically I was stood at the whiteboard and I had to do it in one take. There was no editing facilities or anything like that. And I, as you can see, I, I, I would have like maybe a mistake in my slide or I would say something wrong and I would have to, I'm gonna have to start this again. So it was a very, very slow process. So that was March 2013. Um, June 2013, the department came into a little bit of money and we were able to buy a digital video camera. And you can see I was able to make 12 videos um, from that. Um, but the problem with that was I had nowhere to store these videos because I wanted to share them with my students. You couldn't put video files on memory sticks and that, that just wasn't an official way, sorry, an efficient way to sort of share the content because they were huge files. And, you know, if you've got a class of 20 kids, you don't want 20 memory sticks and sort of it just wasn't the way to do it. And one of my students said, why don't you put them on YouTube? And I'd never, ever thought of doing that. Um, and I, I was like, I can't do that. And they went, yeah, you can. Don't worry, everyone's doing it now. So I did and um, I didn't know what to call myself. And one of my um, students actually came up with this name. So you've already heard me talk about Chem Guy. I'm from Sunderland and one of my students said, why don't you call yourself Macam Guy? Because obviously people from, if you know this, you might know this, but people from Sunderland are called Macams. So I've kind of twisted it a little bit and instead of M-A-C-K-E-M, it's M-A-C-H-E-M. So quite a cool name that I can't take any credit for. It was one of my students that did that. So the digital video camera allowed me to make... Electron. Well, I'll demonstrate this. that now, OK? So we've got our oxygen atom with its eight electrons and its eight protons. So let's say the green stand for protons. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. OK, so the great thing about that kind of video was I could sort of record it in sections. So it's a bit like Ken Guy's video. I'm not stood at a whiteboard and I was very sort of reluctant to actually feature in the video. So you, basically you can see my hand and, and that's it. Um, but it, I found it a lot easier to make the videos. I quite enjoyed doing them. So I kind of um, was able to sort of, well, I engineered 12 videos um, in that process. They were on YouTube. My students said that they liked them and they wanted me to make more. I was quite enjoying doing it, so I didn't mind doing uh, making more because I could kind of see a, a benefit for doing it. Um, but the, the thing that I wasn't sort of banking on was other people were watching it. So I could see my viewing figures were going up and I was thinking, I don't teach this many kids. So other people are watching these videos and, and getting something out of them. So that was kind of a, a, a sort of catalyst, if you like, for me to want to do, do more of them. OK. So Electron. well, I'll demonstrate that now. Done that again, sorry. Um, and then the, the sort of breakthrough really for me was in March 2014. So sort of about a year later. Um, again, you know, the, the department, I think judging by the date there, that we must have had some money left in those days when you had money left in your, um, in your budget and you had to spend it. Um, I decided to go for an iPad and a MacBook, believe it or not, those those days are long gone now, but I was able to get those for the department. The reason I went for those was um, my daughter, who was about, she's 21 now, so um, she's about 13 at the time, something like that. Um, she was using an iPod, an iPod Touch, believe it or not, to make little videos, and she was teaching me how to use um, iMovie. So that's why I went down that route. And so I was being taught by my 11 year old daughter on how to use the editing software. Um, I found the content much, much easier to make. And sort of I was able to make lots of different types of videos. On, I'll show you just short clips of the types of videos that I was able to make quite easily with this sort of stuff. So I was able to make teaching videos a bit like the one you've just seen. But I was using the iPad as a camera. Um, and the great thing about that was the footage could be recorded on the iPad 
I could edit it using the iMovie app, which was on the iPad, and I could push it to YouTube, all from the I iPad. So it became a lot more um, a lot more efficient uh, for me to make the videos. Um, the other types of videos I was able to make were um, I got into making sort of revision type videos as well, um, which were more like screencasts. So I did those on the MacBook because at the time the iPad wasn't able to to do screen recording, whereas they are now, which I'll, I'll show you later on. So revision type videos. And um, later on, I've been able to make screencasts on the iPad using the uh, Apple Pencil as well. So those three types of videos there have kind of evolved over the time. So it all started back in 2014. It's 2021 now, so I'm kind of still learning the, the craft, if you like. And they're nowhere near as good as I would like them to be when you see how good um, pe other people's videos are. But anyway, they seem to work. Um, so I've, van I've managed to make over 850 videos now. So if you think about the sort of I made three screen R videos um, and then I made 12 videos using the digital video camera and then as soon as I kind of got the, the the Apple stuff I'm sure you can do it on other things as well but because of my daughter etc I was able to churn them out and I've, I've made over 850 so the entire A level chemistry syllabus is now is now covered so just very quickly so teaching video. That's everything, so we'll get on and do the titration. So obviously the first thing we need to do is put our safety equipment on. So we've got our lab coat on, buttoned up, and safety glasses on, and they now need to stay on for the duration of the experiment. So what I would use that, that sort of video for is um, I would, if I was doing a, a practical, especially with the year 12 students, so they're all coming from different secondary schools. Different secondary schools have different sort of um, availability of, of, of equipment. And um, some students wouldn't have a clue what this equipment was. They've never had, you know, never touched them before. Other students have used them and were quite proficient with them. And what I was finding was it was taking a long time in a lesson to explain to students, this is a burette, um, this is a pipette filler, this is what you need to do. You do this first. Be careful with that and so on. And you and I could see the students who'd never seen this stuff before were looking absolutely terrified because they thought, oh, my God, um, what am I meant to do with all this stuff? And the other students who'd done it before at school, you know, because their schools had the kit, um, they were just looking really bored because they were on James. I know exactly what to do. Can I not just get on and do it? So. The great thing about these videos, this type of video was I would I would push the video to the student and say, right, before we do this practical, which will be next week sometime, I want you to watch this video so that when you come in, you can just get on and do the practical. And it worked. So I was able to go from sort of basically wasting 40 minutes in a lesson talking through all of this. They'd already covered that via my video on YouTube. Um, so that as soon as they came into the lesson, they would literally walk in, put their lab coats on and start the experiment. And you could quickly tell who hadn't watched the video because they, they looked a bit lost. But I think the, just the sort of the the embarrassment caused really from people who did know what to do because they had watched the video kind of just got everybody on board. That, that's kind of the way of um, what I've observed from this. So. These are sort of what I call teaching videos. Um, the other, oops, I've done it again. Um, once I've done all the teaching videos, I kind of got into what I call quick revision videos because I kind of, I wanted something, a new project basically for me. So the content had been covered now on, you, on YouTube via the videos. So I thought I'll go for some just sort of screencast things. So. Here's an example. Quick revision video on alkanes. So we'll start with the basic properties. Alkanes are hydrocarbons, so they contain carbon and hydrogen atoms only. They are saturated. Okay, I won't bore you with the chemistry, but 
Um, basically, it's literally just I would make a set of PowerPoint slides that I would have produced anyway for the students, you know, sort of um, we've, we've done the Alkanes topic. Here's my slides that I would give them as a revision to what I thought would be a useful thing to do would be to talk through them um, and record it all. So basically it would be like having me like in the lesson, but they could watch it as many times as they wanted kind of thing. And the other good thing about this is because they are in control of the pause and play button, they can sort of rewind, they can watch it again, they can and what they used to, what I noticed the word starting to do was they would come into the lesson and go, James, you know, in that video that you, you mentioned, I didn't quite understand that little thing. And I was thinking, oh, right, this is really good. This, this is, you know, I hadn't thought that that would be a possibility. So that was, that was, that was a real bonus of that. Um, so these are sort of screencast type videos. Good revision video. And then. The sort of more recent, the more recent videos, the, this is I've done this on my iPad, a, a newer iPad. I've sort of invested in a, a newer, better one that actually can screen record. So I'll just start this. Hey everyone, I thought I'd do just a really quick video on how to key um, thing. So I can actually word heat underneath. draw things. I can explain and things as I'm drawing it. To the flask in the vertical position is the cold so water uh, blank. As you put some ready form of seal um, reflux in. So, so that was that was a really useful type of video as well. And what I've done sort of more recently is um, got into doing um, sort of walkthroughs of questions. So you know, if I do um, a particular exam question in class. I might do a walkthrough of the solution for that question in case again a, a student might be off for the lesson or they might be um, they might not have, have kind of fully got what I did or maybe I went a little bit too fast or they weren't paying attention in the lesson god forbid but you know all these things that they were distracted so these kind of videos are useful for that sort of thing hey everyone so I haven't really talked about flipped learning yet so um when I, as I was making those videos, certainly back in the sort of 2013, 2014, I was literally just thinking I'll make some videos. They'll be useful for the students to um, to sort of revisit if they need some sort of extra help. I could get them to watch something advanced if they were doing a practical so we weren't wasting time in the lesson and then sort of uh, bubbling along in the in the in the background and this was kind of getting quite a bit of momentum in um, America was this idea of flipped learning um, which my principal at the time was kind of promoting to me I think maybe you could see that I might be interested in doing it so he kind of sowed a seed and just said I think I think you might quite like this um, because he knew I was getting into the video side of things um, so I'm sure you all know what flipped learning is, but the, the traditional kind of model is, you know, that's me, the students are there, we're teaching them in the lab about the chemistry, and then I would set them a homework activity to check they understand it, and they would do that at home. So obviously what the flip model says is, I'm going to teach you outside of the lab um, at home, um, and then in the in the classroom, I can check how much you understand it, how well you understand it. And, um, you know, can I push you further than that? maybe I would have been able to if I'd had to spend all of the lesson teaching you the content. So that's kind of the model. And the sort of um, the, the typical purpose of this was exposure to bite sized course content outside the lesson. So, you know, instead of overloading the students, you were just giving them little nuggets of things that they could sort of digest um, a bit more easily. Motivate the students outside of the classroom. Um, they can use the technology on the go um, as and when they needed to use it. Um, and it, like I said before, because I'd already kind of taught them the content, um, I could really sort of get them to apply the knowledge in, in the class, which was which, which I found really, really powerful. Um, it generates a collaborative approach between me and the student and also student student collaboration as well. Um, that that became more possible. Um, and obviously the students that I teach in the main go on to higher education. 
So you're kind of preparing them for being independent learners. Even though I was kind of saying you must do this pre-task, um, it was kind of trying to engender this um, this sort of sense of responsibility for taking ownership in their own learning, which you know some students really really caught bought into this. Not everybody did, but a lot of students did. Um, and the other great thing I've kind of already mentioned, it allows the students to work at their own pace. Um, so how did I bring the flipped learning into my teaching? So it's very much been a journey from 2015. So the first thing I want to, I'm going to say is I went way too too far into it at the start. Um, I was I was way too flipped. I, I, I basically tried to teach everything remotely, which was which, which was a mistake. Um, we'd the principal that we had at the time um, had a um, sort of colleagues who were a lot of them were Ofsted inspectors and what have you. And um, the science department here was was lucky enough to get um, uh, a visiting Ofsted inspector to come in. So he used to come in about once a month um, and just do little observations and just give us our, you know, give us a bit of feedback and say, you know, do you want to try this? You might try that. And the guy that visited me um, used to go on about a college in Yorkshire. I won't name the college, but um, he was talking about a college in Yorkshire. And the reason he, he sort of brought it to my attention was because of their sort of chemistry prowess. Um, they had a department. I couldn't believe this when he was telling me. So they had a department and they had over 900 chemistry students in the college, just a sixth form college, but they had over 900 chemistry students. Their results were unbelievable. Um, and there was sort of 11 members of staff. And I just thought I've got to try and get in and see what they do. Um, and I managed to get in um, back in 2018. I, I, I managed to get in. I had a failed attempt of getting in on, in 2017. Um, and then 2018, I managed to get in and see the college. And I was surprised at what I saw because what I saw was quite a traditional approach to teaching. So I was in a real dilemma because I was kind of going down this route of um, I want to get more technology into my teaching and that sort of thing. I want to get into flipped learning and this Ofsted inspectors saying you need to go and see this college in Yorkshire because you could learn a lot from them. Um, and at first I thought how is this going to work? So essentially what they did um, and I've kind of subsequently made my equivalent of this. They had notes packs for every single topic taught um, in, in chemistry. OK, so this is an example of one that I've made OK, since visiting the college because I could see it obviously worked because their results were unbelievable and they had 900 plus students. So these were um, the notes packs. An example, this is my version of them, and they also had study packs, which were essentially just a batch of questions that they'd sourced from, you know, various um, sources, textbooks, other textbooks, exam papers, that sort of thing. So every topic had an associated notes pack and study pack. Um, and I asked them, you know, I'm, I'm quite keen on flipped learning and um, and I could tell that it wasn't something that they wanted to um, get into, basically. So I felt really torn because I was being sort of not pushed, but it strongly suggested that I kind of followed this model. But I also wanted to, I could see the sort of power of the flipped learning as well. So I kind of came up with, with my own sort of blended approach. So I've got a little graphic to show you on that. So basically what I did was I would, um, I've got, had all my videos, or I, I was still in the process of making the videos. So they lived on YouTube. I had all of my learning, my teaching resources on, on Google Drive. I was also getting into Google Classroom at this point as well. So kind of, I, I need to talk about that as well in a second. But basically my resources were all shifted over to Google Drive um, and 
pretty much lessons follow this kind of format. Um, so it might have been watch, watch one of my videos, make notes on it before you get to the lesson, um, read this article. So people might be thinking, you know, I don't really want to get into making videos. I don't have time to make videos. I think what this hopefully I'll get across is you don't have to do that. You can do this via, you know, pushing articles to students that they need to read, um, getting them to plan a presentation, that sort of thing. So that was all done outside of the classroom before the lesson. And then the lesson pretty much follows this format. So I might present the notes through the notes pack, work through the notes with the students, um, get them to do the study pack tasks, which are all differentiated, and that enables me to assess their understanding. So because I've kind of already taught them um, remotely, um, I can assess I'm more available to sort of get in amongst them and see how, they, how their understanding is. Mark the answer, so I would put an answer on the screen and I would get the students to mark it in the room and just, you know, have a discussion amongst themselves, you know, the usual thing. I would put us. I would put an answer on the um, that I would. I would. I would normally write these and put in the classic mistakes and just can you see what's wrong with this? It might be that they do a practical experiment. Obviously, we do a lot of that in chemistry, so that they'll have already watched me do this practical, um, so that they know how to use the equipment. Um, and then normally at the end of the lesson, um, something like a Kahoot or a, a Quizlet Live or something like that to assess their understanding and to break the boredom up, I suppose, of this, because the students have all love this, this kind of interactive stuff. And then some kind of traditional type homeworks, post lesson tasks, shared on Google Classroom, um, pass paper questions, plan a presentation. I don't do a lot of that, to be honest, because the students really feel uncomfortable. I probably should push them more with that, but um, I don't do as much of that um, as the other things. Or it might be a Google Form assessment, which I'll, I'll be bringing into the into the presentation in, in a short while. Um, OK. So obviously I'm doing all this stuff. I think it's pretty good. What do my students think? Well, they, they're kind of the real um, sort of judges of it all. So these are just things that I've got students to, to say in the past, because obviously every year you have to do um, a sort of survey on how students are finding things and what have you. So I've saved all the all the sort of responses and I've, I've sort of pulled something together for this. So this student, obviously, they, they, they like having access to the videos. They like to know what they're doing before they go into the lesson. So they're sort of feeling a bit of confident or a bit more confident um, before they actually go into the lesson. Um, great if you miss a lesson. Um, I think one of the fears I did have actually when I started doing this was are students going to stop coming to the lesson because they know it's all on YouTube? That didn't happen. Um, so that that fear was uh, wasn't really a fear I needed to have had. Um, so the, the students like them if they miss a lesson, they want to expand on the notes that they've made in the lesson. They might have missed something in the lesson and they'll go back and they might hear me say something in the video that maybe I didn't say or they missed it in the lesson so they can sort of pad their notes out that way. And obviously they can always go back to stuff and revise from, so they found that very, very useful. Um, it means I've got access to my teacher if I'm ever stuck. Um, I didn't feel like I was being bombarded with emails from from students either. It was a student would watch the video and they'd, all oh, right, I get it now kind of thing. So um, whereas students in previously to that were, were emailing and going, I don't understand this. Can you explain that? Which is really, really difficult to do by email. Um, and then a student there. So it's like having a lesson on the subject whenever you need it. So that's, that's really nice, I think. OK, so. I think what I need to say now is before. Before I go any further. The, I was starting to notice a problem with this model that I'd created and basically I was trusting students to do the work that I was setting them to do. OK, and I think. Virtually all of the students watch the videos. But I don't 
I didn't think that some of them were engaging properly with the videos because what I try and do is I always kind of explain a concept and then I'll 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 give an example question. I'll say, right, you pause the video and try this question. And what I want students to do is to do that, to go through that learning process. And then when they've answered the question that I've posed, then restart the video and see if they got it right. And I think really some of my students were just were just playing the video and maybe going out the room or whatever, because I could tell some students weren't really getting any better at chemistry. And because I was kind of relying too heavily initially on the flip model, that was why I was think. That's why I said on a, a few slides ago, I was I was too flipped at the start. So um, I've already mentioned Twitter. So I've, I've kind of built up a bit of a following on Twitter, and I was following teachers that were sort of interested in the same sort of things as, as me. And a guy called Bill Wilkinson, who's also a chemistry teacher, um, got in touch with me and said. I want to get into flipped learning and I've I've realized that my students aren't watching the videos that I'm setting and it was kind of ah right okay so it's not just me then that, that was good to hear. So um Bill very kindly um generated some resources for his students but incorporated my videos into it. And so um he called it directly instructed flipped learning. Now He's written blogs and stuff like that. You know, he's very, very um, sorry, proficient and um, prolific on uh, on Twitter, way more than I am. And um, he he's written blogs on loads and loads of learning topics, teaching topics. But um, this one particularly, um, I got I was very interested in. So I'll just show you the kind of thing he did. Okay, so basically he generated a Google form. So that's what this is if you haven't seen one before um, and he embedded my videos into his form. So basically what the students had to do was watch the video, but then they had to answer questions that really they could only answer if they'd watched the video. So I thought that was a really clever, simple way of doing things. OK, so all of these questions in this form, you can only really answer them if you watch the video or if you understand what the topic's about and to be able to do that you would have to do some work which is basically what we want the students to do work outside of outside of lessons and then at the end he, always, he said always ask any questions don't be shy and then what what he did i mean these are the advantages that he saw so he this is what he's i, I, I got this from his blog that he wrote about this so the submissions are all date stamped so basically he could see who was doing the work straight away, who was leaving it till, as he says, 1 a.m. the day before the deadline to watch the videos. And he would be able to have little quiet words with the students and say, I noticed from the Google form, it's a bit big brother, I suppose, but um, you could you could really keep tabs on what the students were doing and just give them the little nudge that they need um, if, if and when they needed it. And what he said to us was once the students realize that you can see what they're doing and when they're doing it, they do the work. So I'll just quickly show you this is a submissions. This is a Google sheet that, that's generated by this form. So I've, I've got got rid of the names, obviously. So these are all the this, that's the first question. What's a buffer solution? So I can quickly just scan down there and I can say, yeah, yeah, everyone gets that. How do you make an acidic buffer? And you can it's really, really quick to mark and I can see you can see there. there's no gaps there. So everybody's everybody's done the task. Um, and then if I just click on. This tab here, any questions, don't be shy. So if we just if you just focus in there. So these students haven't asked any questions. Ah, there's a question. So what I would do would be I would bring that question into my lesson. So and obviously I wouldn't say um, you know, James has asked, what would the, would the conjugate base ion be considered? As, but I would just say somebody's asked this. Um, somebody's asked that one and nobody knew who these people were, but the person who'd asked the question was saying that I was I was actually reading their questions and I was addressing the issues. And maybe some of the people who didn't write any questions wanted to ask that, but just either couldn't be bothered or didn't want to kind of thing. 
So I thought this was a really, really good um, way of making sure that students were actually doing what I was asking them to. Um, so that's kind of what I've just said that. So Bill said, quickly read through student responses before the lesson, see where any misconceptions lay, um, and then address any issues in the class teaching. And then final thing from Bill, you use the student responses to extend questions as a teaching tool. So things like, you know, if he feels like people have got the concept, can you find two mistakes in this? Um, and so on. So since Bill helped me out with that idea, I've kind of sort of copied him sort of thing. So a really good example of collaboration with um, with somebody. I've never met Bill before, actually. It's just all been done via Twitter, which I think is pretty amazing, to be honest. Um, so again, sort of I'm conscious of the time here. I'm just looking at my watch. Um, so benefits from Bill. So a lot of time gained in the lesson because the learning's done outside of the lesson. So you've got more time for application questions, recap, retrieval practice. Um, so student classroom contact time is 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 a lot more um, sort of concentrated on schema building rather than just getting content into students. Okay. Very quickly, how it's benefited others. So like I said before, I do quite a bit of stuff on Twitter as well. So I've shared all of my stuff shared on Twitter. So I just did a quick shout um, a couple of weeks ago, just saying I'm, I'm doing this talk actually at uh, Teesside. So can you just let me know how you've used my stuff? So there you, you can, I'm sure you can just read through these. Um, so there's somebody, Miss Biggs. Again, I don't know who any of these people are, just they're just people who teach chemistry like me elsewhere in the country. Um, so this teacher's using it to, and to, um, to get tips from me, I suppose, as she's saying. Um, to explain them, so stuff like that. Uh, anticipate tricky points for students. Um, there's a teacher who uses it for flipped learning, works a treat, more focus needed when, when, when in lessons, so pretty much backing up what I've said, Bill said, and I'm saying. And then I've put this one in because obviously it's lockdown one, um, the stuff that I've made came into its own really in lockdown one because uh, a lot of, I noticed the views were going up and up and up because obviously no teaching was happening in colleges. So people were using my stuff um, in lockdown one because it was just how, how we're going to teach the students um, during the lockdown. So people use my stuff quite a lot. And the exam boards as well, we're pushing it out as well to, 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 the, to their, to their um, teachers. Okay, very, very quickly. Sorry, I've, um, I, I want to get through this, but um, I need to talk about Google Classroom just very quickly. So Google Classroom, that's how I sort of share all this content with um, with my students. Um, to be honest with you, another session could just be purely devoted to Google Classroom. It's, it's, it, there's so much you could say about it. But basically, I use it to share lesson worksheets, presentations, video links, past exam papers, mark schemes, model answers. All my resources go through Google Classroom. Um, Google Sheets, so that, um, that flipped sheet I showed you, I can monitor students progress um, with, via the sheet. Google Docs, I use that to create worksheets, it's just Google's version of Microsoft Word. Um, I have most of my stuff was on Word and I just converted it. And the reason I did that was because Google Classroom works better with Google products, basically. Um, I often convert them to PDFs before I share them with the students. Another good thing you can do with Google stuff is students can work collaboratively, which you couldn't do it with Microsoft. You I think you can now, where you could have a shared document and you could have two people, three people working on the same document at the same time. Whereas with Microsoft, you have to save copies and it just got a bit messy. Uh, Google Slides, obviously, that's, I'm using a Google Slide now. That's just Google's version of PowerPoint. Again, you can do collaborative work on that. So you can have a, a shared slide, slideshow with other people and kids can work together remotely on the same thing. 
and then Google Forms, I've shown you a Google Form. What's next? Um, more flip topics. So I, I want to, I use flipped learning for some topics, but not all. I'd like to sort of investigate more sort of topics that I can, um, that I can do as flip topics rather than traditional. Um, further develop my Google site for chemistry. So very quickly, Google, you can also make, this is a, a Google site, it's like an intra website. So I just basically house all of my information that I give to the students. It's just like a one stop shop, if you like, of information. So that's all on the Google site. Um, so that's something else I would like to develop. Refresh some old videos. I mean, the first videos I made 2013, they're looking a bit tired now and and stale. So I might get into doing some more of those. Um, what I've been doing most recently since I got this new iPad that I can um, annotate and screen record. I if, if I set a homework, a set of homework questions, I'll make a walkthrough video of the of the homework questions and me answering them. So I'm talking through how you would answer this. And then once the students have done the homework and I've marked it, I would then push the video to the students and then they can watch me go through it on that, which is quite useful, especially as I've just marked their homeworks. I know what all the, the, the sort of common mistakes are and I really focus on those in my um, in, in those types of videos. Um, more chem guy style videos. I feel a bit more confident now with the, with with doing this, so I'll actually stand in front of um, of the video camera very quickly. Got a bunch of Alkenes models. So I've made this quite recently. Try. So uh, the link to the questions. So that was all done on my phone actually. So just with a daft, with a little tripod like that, all done on my phone, all edited on uh, iMovie on my phone and on YouTube. If I don't make any mistakes, I can probably do one of those sort of from from recording to being on YouTube in 10, 15 minutes. It's really a very, very quick process now for me. Um, and maybe get into doing a website, um, but I don't know whether I'd have time to do that. Um, 5.47. Is that all right, Jane? <laughs> yes, spot on, Faf. Thank you so much, James. Um, what we'll do is, um, if anybody does have any questions that they'd like to fire over to you, um, we, like you say, we are here for the next 10 minutes. If anybody does have any questions for you about the session and about what you've delivered. Um, I found that so interesting. I think there's so many things. I know we sort of touched on this earlier, but the transferable sort of little nuggets of information within that presentation that you can apply to subject teaching. But I, I'm sat here thinking as well in terms of our activity that we deliver with 16 to 18 year olds. There's so many things that when you put them across this, they're, they're really simple and they're easy. And I'm just thinking, well, why don't more people do that? Why why aren't we, you know, including videos, including Google Forms and things like that, and just making it a little bit more interactive. And I think as we've discussed, students nowadays, they're very open and accepting and almost expectant of that type of approach, aren't they? When yeah. pretty much everything in their life is technology based and they all have so and the, the, the way the technology, I mean, you'd see the, the sort of progression in the technology from, you know, the first, the, those screen are things, which, you know, it looks like that's, that looked like something that should be in Beamish now. It looks so <laughs> opaque to now, you know, like 10 minutes and I've got a video on YouTube from start to finish just using my phone. I mean, that wasn't possible back in 2013. Uh, what's weird as well, though, and my kids are sort of testimony to this, my 11 year old daughter has no issues with making a little TikTok video for our for our friends. But if I asked her to stand up in, in a class and go, can you do a little present? Imagine she was an A-level student. Can you do a presentation on this? Um, I don't think she would do it. But if I said, can you make a TikTok video, you know, TikTok video on this little bit of chemistry? You might have more of a chance then, maybe. I don't know. It's That's it. Yeah, and I think you, you do see, um, I've noticed recently, um, I follow a lot of colleges and sixth forms and things, and this, you can see they're making that progression over onto TikTok because you yeah. just think that's almost like 
the space, isn't it, that they're spending so much of their time. I mean, totally you can, <laughs> yeah, you can go yeah. for a walk and you'll see like kids are making TikTok videos on the street and you just think that that's it, that's where that's where they're at and that's maybe where we need to come yeah. from. And if things that are useful for them within an educational setting, but they're accessible on those platforms that they're used yeah. to being on, it's just, it's a win-win, isn't it? Definitely, yeah. yeah. Brilliant. I really like the idea of the Google Forms that you can see what time they've completed. I know. It is a bit, um, yeah. it is a bit Big Brother, but I mean that was the problem. But it was really interesting, you know. I was, I was getting quite frustrated because I was making all this stuff, and, you know, some students just weren't buying into it, um, and I and I couldn't find a way to get to well, what can I do to, to make them do it? Make and then, sure. And then through Twitter, Bill just picked up on the fact that I was. I'd made these videos and he said, do you mind if I, you know, and he, he, I said, go, go for it. And then as soon as I saw what he'd done, I thought, that was so simple. Why yeah. did I not come up with that idea? But sometimes you just, it's so obvious you don't see it. Because one of my questions was going to be, and you did sort of touch on it with that, those students that maybe aren't as proactive as others, yeah. maybe don't like working autonomously, you know, that maybe you can't know for sure that when they go home on an evening, they're going to watch those videos. Have you had any particularly difficult situations where students really haven't engaged um i think at, at first yeah i did i did and you know you sometimes you just have to have um a sort of honest discussion with them you know and I, I, at the back of it all i, I knew that I, I can't force you to do this you know i can't force you obviously i'm expecting students to have the technology some students didn't have the technology but luckily the college was able to provide you know hardware that you know, or, or any hurdle that the, the, the student would put and say, I can't because you'd always come back with, well, OK, well, we'll we can we can sort that out for you. And you kind of made it like it sounded like you, you made it sound like, well, you were being supportive, but you were basically putting them into a position where they couldn't really refuse, which sounds a bit terrible, but um, that was kind of where where I was going with that. But if a student just blatantly said, look, I just don't learn this way, I would say, right, OK, then, well, there's a textbook. You need to read that chapter. Mm. Um, you do that and then, but you, you know, you have to do the work that I'm setting you kind of thing. So, um, and luckily, yeah, the students, the students did it, did do it. If you've got those two offerings on a, on a table as well, and it's like either sit with this textbook or, you know, you can spend nope. a little bit of time on YouTube. Usually, yeah. I imagine they'd go for the latter. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And I think that's what that's that is what they did. You know, I think they could see that, you know, it was the better option. Um, yeah, and I would mention before, so I actually studied chemistry at A level, and it was oh. a lot. I can speak from experience. It yeah. is a lot of that. It is a lot of text, but you do get the, you know, the practical, the lab stuff, but there is such a layer of theory behind it, isn't it? That yeah. it's it's great that they're getting that again in that sort of plot on that platform that they're much more familiar with, and it probably doesn't seem as much of a task no. because of how you're delivering it. And it's always there, so they can always, you know, they can, you know, we're, we're big on independent learning, and you know, there's an expectation that students do, you know, the same again, hours wise, outside of lessons, you know, and. I'm kind of I'm created this stuff so that they don't really have an excuse, you know, to not do it. You know, I've I've made it as easy as possible for them. Um, so, absolutely great. Thank you so much, James. That was really interesting. What I'm going to just follow up with as well, because you didn't actually touch on it, but just to let people that are watching know, so you had it was in your biography, of course. You are just short of thirty thousand subscribers on YouTube, aren't you? Yeah. And you are over the six million mark now for views yeah which is huge yeah, yeah it's yeah it's it's all right isn't it i suppose you're very humble i think <laughs> about it all yeah. it's amazing yeah. all right over six point six million views is is bonkers it just goes to show as well like the the width of the audience that you are hitting because like you said it is, it's not just your students is it there's lots of people no. that are finding it so useful and it's not just people in the UK either. It's kind of it's well, it's worldwide to be honest. So, yeah, it's br it's brilliant. I love it. I love the fact that I'm able to do to, to do what I'm do. It's fantastic. Yeah, you are very modest about it though. I just wanted to get those numbers in as well, oh, just to embarrass you. <laughs> <laughs> 
Um, but yeah, so fab, thank you so much, James. What I'll do is I'll just put myself back on screen so you can see who's speaking now. Great. Yeah, so thank you very much to James for that session. It was it was so informative. I think, yeah, I know everybody that's attending is probably going to take something away. I know I certainly am. So um, just thank you again for delivering it. Thank you for those attendees that I can see are still are still with us as well. I know it's six o'clock, so we appreciate you hanging around after hours. Um, just to let you know, we have got more sessions running. We've got two more days of the Supporting Progression series, so please do have a look at what's available. I know tomorrow we're offering um, a session on UCAS, uh, by UCAS on um, reference writing and also supporting students writing personal statements. We have our final keynote speaker tomorrow evening, Lynn Miles from Teesside University, who's running a session on trauma and adversity. And we also have a session on Friday afternoon by Youth Sites, who are delivering a really interesting session around um, Generation Z and them being the unstoppable voice, really considering you know those topics that are important to Generation Z students. So please do join us if you can for any of those sessions as well. I'll say final. Thank you so much, James, for that. It was really interesting. Um, and yeah, we'll hopefully see you at an event soon. But thank you very much, everybody. See you later.